This is Dan Schneider, and on this Dan Schneider video interview, I am speaking with theologian and philosopher Richard Swinburne about the nature of evil, and that discussion will begin in a moment. I am speaking with a theologian and philosopher named Richard Swinburne, and as I usually do in such interviews, I like to give my guests a few minutes to introduce themselves, talk about who they are, any major works they have, websites or books that they want to talk about, and then we'll get into the discussion of evil. So thank you for joining me, Richard. And if you could just tell a little bit of background about you and your opinions on life and the nature of evil. Yes. Um, for 18 years, I was professor of the philosophy of religion at Oxford University. I am now retired but that doesn't make much difference to uh, much of what I do because I still continue to write books and give lectures and talk on television. Um, I, my whole career has been as a philosopher. Uh, I graduate, got my undergraduate and graduate degrees from Oxford University, taught in various places and then came back to Oxford. I've written books on probably most areas of philosophy. I worked in philosophy of science for about 10 years, and then I moved into philosophy of religion. I do have a, a graduate qualification in theology, um, and I've written books on uh, the nature of God, the existence of God, the relevance of faith um, to life. Um, I've written books on um, particular Christian doctrines such as the atonement and the Trinity and the incarnation or the nature of revelation and a, a book on the problem of evil. Um, I've written another philosophical topic, so a book on epistemology, and I've been interested for many years on the relation of mind and body. And um, my latest published book was called Mind, Brain and Free Will, which was published about three years ago. But the problem of evil is very important for theology um, because um, uh, theology of the normal theistic kind that claims that there is a God claims that he is perfectly good and uh, God is supposed to be omnipotent, able to do anything and therefore uh, if he's perfectly good why does he allow human suffering and um, insofar as uh, God is the sole cause of what happens in the world. It isn't uh, altogether because we make quite a difference. But insofar as he is the sole cause of the suffering in the world, he not merely permits it, but causes it. So how can uh, there be such a God who could stop suffering and yet doesn't? And that is the problem of evil. And I think there is a theodicy, there is to say, um, a way in which um, theologian can rightly explain why God should allow a limited amount of evil to occur. Well, let me, uh, before we get a little bit in deep into that, let me just back up bi uh, biographically and just ask you, because I was just looking and it says that you are now uh, of the Eastern Orthodox uh, Christian belief. Uh, clearly you have an English accent, so I would assume you were raised an Anglican. What what uh, uh, precipitated your conversion, if there was indeed a conversion? Um, yes, I was an Anglican for most of my life, but about 20 years ago I changed over. I don't like quite describing it as a conversion because it didn't involve much change of belief on my part, but I think it did involve a change of belief on the part of the Anglican Church. Um, when I was young, to, to belong to the church, or at any rate to be a priest in the church, you had to be pretty committed to certain doctrines, those in the creed. You had to believe that um, uh, Jesus was God incarnate and uh, rose from the dead. Uh, blah, blah. And you have to believe that um, uh, God, through Jesus, revealed certain truths to us. Now. I think that's central to Christianity, but I also think that the Church of England and quite a lot of the churches in communion with it, such as the Episcopal Church in the United States, have really um, downplayed this and thought this unimportant. And um, uh, for that, that's so central to Christianity, in particular the doctrine of the Incarnation, uh, that I felt I, I must leave. Um, I 
think of myself as a very conservative person in religion, but there are limits to what uh, uh, the church can, as it were, uh, give up. And um, I thought that the Church of England had gone too far, so for that reason I moved. Okay, well, uh, one final question biographically, and then I'll uh, go to uh, the notion of evil. Um, I, in reading up on you, a lot of people who disagree with you have called you a Christian apologist. Uh, and Christian apologetics, generally, when most people think of it, they look at the term or, or, or the idea as sort of being excuse-making for usually the excesses of religion. When I would take it, you would uh, argue the opposite, that you're... That the apologetics is merely your way of explaining the cosmos from a, a Christian perspective. Is that correct? Yes, it is. The word uh, apologetics is in uh, a rather unfortunate one. It used to mean uh, um, justifying your belief. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, these days, sure, people sort of understand it as apologizing for your belief. And I don't do that. I attempt uh, these arguments which make it probable that uh, the central doctrines of the Christian religion are true. Okay, well, now let's turn to evil. And uh, just for, you know, there are certainly people uh, in our day and age that would not think of evil uh, even as existing that... Uh, in a lot of sense, science sometimes tries to explain, say, a mass murder or a serial killer as having some kind of mental or, or psychological dysfunction and explain it in a way by biology. So let me ask this basically. Do you think of evil as something that is imminent within mankind or within uh, intelligent beings? Or do you see it as some kind of an external force that perhaps interacts on the mind or the soul the way gravity does on our physical bodies? Uh, well, well, let's take a step back first. Okay. Uh, what do we mean by evil? Um, people can use that word simply to mean some intrinsically bad state, such as me having toothache or uh, uh, any much worse suffering. Um, but, um, uh, and that's one problem, why does God allow even that? Uh, but uh, to talk of an act as evil, I think an act as evil, and that's um, the primary uh, uh, context of the problem of evil, um, talk of an act as an evil is to say that it was uh, consisted in an agent bringing about a state of affairs which you knew was bad without justification for doing so. And um, uh, it's pretty obvious that that happens quite a lot. Um, people do hurt each other deliberately and so on. And um, if God is the cause, the direct cause of human uh, pain and dis in, the in the course of disease, then uh, and he had no justification, he did have no justification for that, then he would be evil. What is the, the source of this? Um, well, in the case of humans, uh, we are subject to temptations. That is to say, we are subject to desires, to, uh, inclinations we find ourselves with to do what is bad. And we're also subject to desires to do what, although normally it's good, is not good in a certain context. For example, desires to eat, which would normally be good, but if other people are very short of food, uh, ought to be held in <coughs> control. Okay, we're subject to these desires, but I think we have a limited amount of free will, and therefore we can choose whether or not to yield to them. And uh, that is the cause of the evil brought about by knowingly brought about by, or through negligence allowed to occur by, human beings. So I would take it then uh, one of the things that you would argue evil has to consist of is agency, meaning that you're not, I would say then you probably don't believe in so-called natural evils like an earthquake wouldn't be evil. If an earthquake killed, say, a quarter of a million people or the tsunami of 2004, that wouldn't be evil, but let's say if some dictator in some banana republic ends up killing 250,000 of his political opponents, that would be evil, even though the same amount of people basically died, correct? Wait a moment, wait a moment. Um, 
and as I say, you can use the word evil in either sense, and that simply as an intrinsically bad state, or as okay. a deliberate bringing about of an intrinsically bad state. Uh, but um, uh, confining ourselves to the latter, um, uh, nevertheless, if an earthquake occurs, and if there is a God, then God as our creator um, is responsible for the laws of nature which bring about the earthquake. And therefore, if it had been brought about by God, um, and uh, it would be evil unless there was justification for God bringing it about. Well, what sort of justification, for example? Are well, you talking like a Sodom and Gomorrah thing, some kind of punishment from above? No, no, no. no. There's variable various sorts. Um, uh, if we move on, I think I'd rather start with moral evil, if you okay. don't mind, because go ahead. my explanation of natural evil will follow on rather naturally from All right, go ahead. So if we could start with moral evil. Um, um, humans do harm to each other because they yield to temptations, which because they have free will, they could resist. And it's, but it's a very good thing that we should have limited free will. Um, it's a very good thing that we should be responsible for each other. Uh, the parents should have the deep responsibility of bringing up their children and others. And we all have responsibilities for the well-being of others in various ways. But we couldn't be really responsible for someone's well-being unless whether it went well with them was entirely up to us. And that means we couldn't really be responsible for them unless, were we not to do the right uh, thing, uh, they would suffer. So it's a good thing that um, we have free will with moral with responsibility, in other words, free will that can make a difference to people. But of course, there's a price to pay. Now, uh, going on from that, um, Imagine a world in which uh, there were no earthquakes, no disease, no accidents. Uh, the only evil that anybody did to each other was uh, malevolent action. There wouldn't be very much uh, suffering in the world at all in those circumstances. And in particular, in those circumstances, uh, most of us would have very little opportunity to do really heroic actions. It's only the presence of disease and accident and so on that gives us significant choices. For example, uh, suppose I am ill, badly ill, then I have a choice. I have a choice of how to deal with this. Um, uh, to be patient, uh, to be grateful for what has happened in my life to, despite this and so on, or to be bitter. That's a very significant choice I have. And other people have choices to how to deal with me. They can either look after me well, care for me, be sympathetic, or alternatively neglect me and be callous. So the very fact of my suffering opens up certain choices for me and for them which would not otherwise exist. Um, if we yeah, had a disease and accident um, simply occurred, um, if, if there were no disease and accidents, then there wouldn't be those sort of choices. Um, and uh, that is the main point of natural evil. It opens up to us serious choices. But serious choices, if you make the right serious choice, it's not very good in itself, but it makes it easier to make a good choice next time. And if you make a bad choice, it makes it easier to make a bad choice next time. That means that every time we do a good action, we gradually form a good character. Every time we do a bad action, we gradually form a bad character. Now that means that our choices are the means for us to make ourselves, um, and a good God would want to make us not merely people who enjoy doing ordinary things and had a reasonable life. He'd want to make us saints. And um, the, 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 we should ourselves have the choice of whether to be saints or not. Uh, is only possible if we make a lot of serious good choices. 
So we need natural evil in order to have serious choices, and it's very good for us that we do. Well, you just by saying, it sounded like you were talking about a step to sort of spiritual evolution by making good choices that points you in a direction towards goodness and vice versa by making bad choices or evil choices yeah. that points you to a more evil nature. Let me just uh, counter with what uh, an evolutionary biologist might uh, argue and, and see what your opinion is. Um, a lot of people would talk about something called secular ethics, whereas morality is derived from an outside source, presumably God or a God or gods. Secular ethics would have been something that would have evolved naturally, i.e. the most obviously case, obvious case being, say, a mother's love for her child. Uh, a biologist would say, well, it's good for a mother to take care of her child. Uh, there are, there are the, the secretions from the mother's milk. Uh, the the pheromones, the the all of the chemicals that bond a mother and child together are good because the child cannot fend for itself for eighteen years or fifteen years, however long, until the child could you know hunt and gather in a hunter gather yeah. society. So, uh, would you argue then that good and evil uh, can or, or have evolved from natural circumstances? You would then just argue that God made those natural circumstances for that evolution. Uh, yes, basically. I think the fundamental pr principles of morality are quite independent. They are necessary truths. They are as necessary as one and one makes two. They're independent of what people do. It's good to help people, it, other things being equal. It, it's bad to hurt them, other things being equal. It's good to keep promises. It's bad to break promises and so on. These are independent of the will of God, independent of uh, uh, whatever an evolutionary biologist might tell you. But what an evolutionary biologist will tell you, probably correctly in most cases, uh, he will point out the mechanisms by which we come to be aware of these truths. And uh, he will point out uh, that um, different circumstances lead us to apply these, how different circumstances lead us to apply these truths. Uh, for example, the circumstances that uh, human babies, the one you pointed out, uh, take a long time to grow up, uh, means that our duty to care for our offspring lasts a long while. And that till we can only know by knowing the contingent facts about how long it takes people to grow up. So, uh, of course, the evolutionary process is a means by which we come to, sometimes, to some extent, come to learn about what are the truths of morality. And it helps us to see, knowing how the world works, how we shall apply these basic truths, but it doesn't cause the Basic truths. They're, they're quite independent of anything that might happen in the universe. Well, let me just then uh, end this segment by asking, uh, do you believe that, for example, a good impulse can uh, inadvertently go astray and become a bad impulse? Let me just give you an example. Uh, suppose uh, we're in a hunter-gatherer society where Two, two societies, two, two tribes, and we're battling over some resource, a, a, a clean water in a river or a fertile field. It would be a good impulse for me to want my people, my tribe, to get that field, to get that source of water. And you, leading the other tribe, would argue the same. Therefore, it would be a good impulse to, by whatever means necessary, eliminate the threat to that resource that you could provide for your tribe or your clan. Therefore, you get war evolving out of a good impulse to protect your people. Uh, so is that would that be an example of evil arising from good? As you say, the impulse is a good, but uh, we need to be aware of other moral truths, which uh, we can also be helped to become aware of. Um, and that is to say that uh, all human beings... Uh, uh, deserve uh, help from us, and um, uh, we mustn't insist on all the water for our own people. Um, uh, it's, it's the particular circumstances that, that mean that we have to inhibit, to some extent, some desires. I, I did say that earlier, that is to say, uh, we often have good desires which need in certain circumstances to be kept in check. And if we don't keep them in check, 
then uh, we've yielded to a temptation. Okay. Well, uh, let's end this segment here. And uh, in our next segment, I want to sort of broaden the scope a little bit, talk about maybe evil uh, in more modern societies and evil as more of a philosophical concept. And we will do that in a moment. I am speaking with Richard Swinburne, a philosopher and theologian, about the nature of evil and his views upon such. Um, one of the things I was just watching uh, over the last week, rewatching the the old uh, documentary series, The World at War, from uh, England about the Second World War, um, back from from the nineteen seventies, um, and uh, uh, you know, there you have a clash of. Uh, civilizations. You have two different types of what most people would call evil, uh, national socialism, fascism, and also communism. Um, you get the people like the Hitlers, the Stalins, the Maos, who uh, even maybe from different backgrounds end up doing very similar evil things. One of the things that I have often thought of, having worked for many decades in, uh, in uh, uh, American <laughs> corporate life, uh, is that a lot of the bigger evils of life necessarily could not come about if there were not thousands of smaller evils, i.e., you need the apparatchiks that look away, that don't stand up for what is right, and that allows the Pol Pots or the Hitlers or the Stalins or the Castros to rise up. Some people would not look at those small acts, though, as evil. Do you look at them as evil? And do you have sort of an evil hierarchy, you know, sins, crimes, murder, rape? I mean, is there a hierarchical nature to the, the idea of evil that you have, and, and what what might that be? Uh, yes, I agree with both your points. Um, the great evils of this world are uh, not just evils of one man or woman. Uh, they, uh, the man or woman has only got away with it because a lot of people, are, as you say, have been encouraged to look the other way. Uh, and indeed, uh, in the case of the great evils, um, it's been a process of many centuries. I think the Holocaust would never have come about but for an atmosphere of anti-Semitism, uh, which uh, had its roots at least a thousand years before then. Um, gradually, people were non-Jews were encouraged to look at Jews as uh, diff, as uh, uh, not not as good human beings, as uh, uh, possibly responsible for um, uh, certain murders or certain uh, financial scandals, and gradually. Uh, People were encouraged to think, well, it wouldn't be any harm to be nasty to these people. And um, this gradually built up and built up until we got to Hitler. And Hitler was able to preach his message of exterminating the Jews. Um, and a lot of people uh, felt that was a good thing because of the anti-Semitism atmosphere. But a lot of people felt it was a bad thing, and they were unwilling to say anything against it because so strong was the peer pressure. And to um, the stronger peer pressure is, the, the more difficult it is to do the right thing if your peers have got it wrong. That's a very great um, influence on, uh, in the world. Uh, people who uh, want to be regarded as acceptable by other people. And if there is a commonly accepted view, uh, it takes courage to go against it. So, yes, uh, a lot of the great evils of the world are caused by a lot of people doing small evils over a long time. And you asked me to distinguish between the great evils and small evil. Uh, uh, you can distinguish them first by uh, their effects. Um, it's uh, an evil thing to say anything uh, that's false, uh, deliberately to say it at all. A very small one, unless that false evil leads to us thinking badly of someone. That makes it a bit worse. But of course, 
uh, saying something nasty about someone is not nearly as uh, bad a thing as actually uh, trying to uh, hurt them physically. And um, it's clearly worse to uh, hurt a lot of people physically than just to hurt one person physically. And it's worse to kill and just to uh, uh, break someone's leg. And it's uh, worse to kill a lot of people than to uh, kill just some people. And so on. There's an obvious uh, hierarchy in, uh, in respect to the harm done. But there's also a hierarchy in respect to uh, uh, how easy it was to do the right thing. Um, and uh, to whether you realized it was the right thing. Um, some people who uh, are very negligent about their children, it never occur occurs to them that uh, they ought to be looking after their children. And so that's not as bad as if it had occurred to them. Um, and some people who uh, look the other way are, are under such it would be so difficult for them to to, to uh, say the right thing in those circumstances because so many people they 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 are not influential people and the people they look up to hold the contrary view so that it's very difficult for them to say the right thing so there's a hierarchy in respect of um, how knowingly and how easily it was to do the right thing. And there's also a hierarchy in respect to the seriousness of the evil caused. Well, let me give you an example. Let, let me step down towards the more personal because it's, you know, it's, it's very easy to talk in, in these big, broad strokes, you know, the way uh, Stalin talked yeah. about one yeah. one murder being a tragedy and, you know, a million plus being a statistic kind of thing. Um, I want to talk a little bit, especially since uh, you are a Christian, about the notion of sin, which is uh, a more religious-based uh, view of an evil, versus, say, crime, which is more of a legal-based version of an evil, and how there may be some failures in between. And I want to sort of pose a little question, for example. Um, uh, now I would assume that you are retired from... Uh, uh, as a retired professor, but let's let's say uh, a, a few decades ago uh, you're working at your university, and uh, I want to give two two uh, examples. Let's say after work one day you go to a, a football game and your favorite team wins, and you go out to celebrate with some of your friends at a pub. You get a pint of beer, and as you're leaving, uh, some guy comes along, bonks you from behind, and steals all your money. Now, most people would say that's a sin, you were robbed, uh, that's certainly a crime. No one would say that that was not evil. But let's go to something a little bit more subtle. Let's say instead of that, you're called in one day uh, by the dean of your school or by whoever might be your immediate superior, and for some, for some reason, uh, a co-worker has lied about you in some way, said that you did some wrongdoing, some malfeasance, and this ends up getting you fired or sacked from your job. And over the next 20 years, you've lost X amount of income, far in excess of what might have been in your wallet that one night when you were robbed. Now, most people would say, well, the the corrupt, either the person who lied about you or the dean or your superior may have also been corrupt. Uh, but what they did was just a sin, perhaps, but it wasn't a crime. But in, in reality, you have lost a lot more because of that action, which is not legally say considered a crime. Uh, so how do you put those kinds of more subtle things uh, in the determination of evil? The outright criminal act, which loses you a little bit, versus the more subtle act of what I would consider evil that may cost you much more greatly in the course of your life. Well, a crime is simply a violation of the uh, law of the land. And um there are crimes which are rather good things if the law of the land is rather bad. Yeah. Not usually because most countries have fairly good laws, but clearly there are cases where it's good to break the law. Um, so that's just a, a, a legal matter. Um, uh, sin uh, is wronging God. It's doing a wrong to God. Now, 
if I, for example, well, steal something from you, then I've wronged you. Uh, and if there were no God, then that would be the only person I'd wronged. But I've also wronged God, and for two reasons. Uh, God has given me life, and he's given me life in, in the hope and expectation that I would use that life in the right way. And so I wronged him by letting him down in the way that I would let my parents down uh, also by doing such an act. But there's a further way in which I wronged God. I wronged God because the person I stole from, let's say you, um, the person I stole from uh, was also created by God. And if I hurt your children, I hurt you. And if I hurt God's children, as other people are in a metaphorical sense, then I hurt God. So I've sinned against God in both of these ways. Now, so there, there's wronging people, uh, morally wronging people, and wronging God. Now, in your two examples, um, uh, uh, if somebody stole money from me, then they would do me a moral wrong. They would also do me a legal wrong. But uh, they would also wrong God because, for the two reasons I've given, uh, if I wrong, if someone wrongs another human being, they wrong God. Coming on to your other example, um, uh, if, as you say, <laughs> Uh, telling uh, 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 bad things about me to the dean gets me sacked. Um, uh, you say that isn't a, a legal crime. Well, I suspect it is in most countries. But um, that, by the way, it's certainly a morally wicked thing. Um, and I would think it's a more wicked thing than just, just stealing money from somebody uh, in the street because it's a deliberate act. Um, it's not something somebody might do uh, quickly because they feel like it. It's a deliberate act which has la lasts some time. They have to go on uh, standing by their story and the effects are very great. So I think that is a very bad act, a very evil act. Um, and it wrongs me badly. It's morally wrong in that respect. And for the same reason as I give before, it's a wrong to God and therefore a big sin. Well, it, it's been my experience in life that for every you know act of like a robbery, as I described, versus uh, either an envious co-worker or a, a poor boss who wrongly dismisses someone or maybe doesn't dismiss them, but is, is harassing them at work and, and consider it you know, giving them great duress and stress over an extended period of time. I'm just wondering then what kind of remedy to that more subtle form of evil can there be? And can a society be considered good and just if those kinds of evils have no real uh, recourse? Because let's face it, we, we, can, we can talk about it in, in the abstract sense of being uh, more greatly wrong, but it's also much more difficult to prove than, say, some guy with a blackjack who conks you on the head and there's a physical, you know, mark and he maybe has his fingerprints on the, the weapon of assault. Uh, yes, well, that's, that's very true. Uh, I agree with you. It is uh, often very difficult to prove this sort of uh, some sort of evil that uh, involves uh, me getting sacked for something that I didn't do. Uh, but in principle, uh, society needs laws against that, and in principle, um, uh, people should be seriously punishable for that. Um, there are, the law can only lay down as a crime things that can be fairly and readily detected, um, and also I think uh, the law has to stay out of very private matters. Uh, for example, um, adultery, I think, is a terrible uh, wrong, wrong uh, to a spouse, but uh, there's nothing against the law in it. Um, and I think there's reasons why the, the law shouldn't interfere too closely with the details of, of a private life, uh, because it, it um, uh, takes... Uh, it, takes away the intimacy of the private life in that way. Um, 
but um, uh, yeah, so um, sure, um, once uh, laws which punish manifest obvious public crimes, um, and but there's a limit. The law can't aim to uh, uh, punish everything that's that's morally wrong because um, it must. Uh, it can't or shouldn't interfere too much with a detail, a deep personal relationship between people. But with that qualification, uh, if the laws are good, every breach of the law uh, is wrong, uh, is not merely legally wrong, but morally wrong and a sin to God. Um, but um, there are moral wrongs. Uh, which are not breaches of the law, and some of them are very serious ones. Well, it sounds to me then that you would be ad advocating in your Christian worldview something akin to what others have called karma. That is, that the robber who robbed you would probably most likely get his just comeuppance by serving 30 days or whatever it might be in the county jail, whereas the corrupt co-worker or the boss who's harassing you or gets you sacked may have to wait till some kind of spiritual afterlife to get some kind of comeuppance for his or her actions. That does sound to me like karma. Is that something that you are in sync with, with, with your belief system? Uh, I didn't catch this word, karma. Ka karma, K-A-R-M-A, -A, karma, the idea oh, karma. that... Karma. Karma, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, um, no, uh, karma says you get these things automatically. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, Hindu or Buddhist idea is every time you do a, a nasty thing in this world, then your next life is going to be a bit the worse for it. Um, and that's not a Christian view. Uh, the Christian view is that we can always be forgiven if we are seriously penitent, uh, and however much wrong we've done, uh, if we um, make apology to those we have wronged and to God, and uh, reparation, and insofar as we can't make reparation, then the reparation provided by Christ in his atoning life and death is what we can ask God to accept instead of the reparation we are unable to make. But given, the, given that we uh, really are sorry, God will forgive us, and uh, let us hope uh, the ones we have wronged will forgive us. And uh, there is a very strong uh, teaching of Jesus that God only forgives people who are ready to forgive other people. And um, so, no, there is, if we are truly sorry, there is no come up and sin in the next life. It's only if we persist in our malevolent uh, life that there is going to be comeuppance in the next life. Okay, well, th this is one of the things I like about doing these interviews is because little points come up in, in things that he said. You just uh, said something along the lines that God only forgives those who are willing to forgive or, or, or something along that line. Now, let's yeah. if we step back to some great evil, whether you want to talk about the Holocaust or the mask of Native Americans or any other mass crimes too long to list, by what you just stated, it would seem to me that if there is an afterlife and there is a God, uh, let's say a, a person who is a victim of some great atrocity or, or millions of people, uh, that God would be willing to forgive the Hitlers or the Stalins or the Pol Pots, etc. But if those individual people or their spirits or their, their souls, whatever you'd like to call it, were, were so unforgiving, that would mean that, that you would be stating that the soul of a Hitler or a Stalin would be more acceptable to that God than the, the victim of a Hitler or a Stalin who was saying, no, I'm not willing to forgive. Am I, did, did I misunderstand what you stated? No, that, that is quite right, and I accept that. Um, that seems to me correct. Um, but I also think that, um, as I people have an obligation to give, <laughs> God only forgives those who are willing to give. Um, uh, I think you should only give, forgive people who want to be forgiven. Um, I think it's uh, an impertinence to, uh, as it were, if somebody 
for example, uh, um, if uh, somebody did something uh, nasty to you and uh, you uh, summon up your courage and say, I forgive you, uh, and that's an impertinence because he's, tre he's treated you badly and you mustn't assume he didn't mean it. You must give people credit for meaning what they do. And uh, but it's only when he says him sorry that he's sorry that he distances himself from his action and so makes himself open to your forgiveness. And so, um, in the in the ca in the case of uh, Hitler, um, he's got to want to be forgiven uh, before God will forgive him. And. Um, uh, and he's got to want to be forgiven by those whom he has wronged. But if he does seriously, seriously want to be forgiven, if he's really changed his attitude to life, uh, then I think it's good for victims to forgive him. Uh, and if they don't, I uh, don't see they have a right to expect God to forgive them. Um, I don't mean God will punish them, but I think God is not going to reward them. Okay, well, I, that 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 clarifies a little bit because let's say you know certainly I'm not saying that everyone who might have died say in Auschwitz was a saint. There were probably people who were adulterers, probably even a few murderers and and whatnot. But certainly their crime would pale against those of a Himmler or a Goering or a or, yes. or a Hitler. And. Uh, uh, but it would seem to me, I, I think a lot of people have argued, and so have, uh, most atheists would probably argue, and certainly secular philosophers would argue, that it would be impertinent of any god to presume to forgive uh, a transgressor against someone else, especially if it's someone who murdered uh, someone's family, not just one person, but maybe wiped out a whole family, wiped out a whole town. Um, do, you, do you see any kind of problem, though, with the idea that an extra a, a, a being god or whatever you'd want to call it a deity uh, taking it upon him or herself to expiate uh someone who's committed a great crime or, or you know uh, do you not yeah, yeah, get your point, get your point. Uh, well uh, i'll answer in a minute but first one point um yeah. if uh, <laughs> if uh Hitler or whatever has exterminated a whole town, then I am not entitled to forgive him for what he's done to the other people. I could only uh, <coughs> forgive him for what he's done to me. Um, uh, so whatever I say, uh, they would uh, they need to forgive him. Uh, uh, and um, he must, of course, try to seek the forgiveness of everyone he has wronged. Um, but uh, God's role in the picture is just this. Uh, God has made Hitler. God has made the people whom Hitler has hurt. And um, uh, what he is... Uh, the wrong that he has done to God is the wrong he has done by himself, a creature of God, given a life and so on, behaving in this way. And he's also wrong, God, as I said earlier, by hurting the people whom uh, God has made. So what God can forgive him for, if he's really penitent, is those two things. But he still owes, he still owes an apology to the other people whom he has hurt. But in my view, if he is truly apologetic enough, even if they refuse to forgive him, um, I think his um, uh, as well, guilt uh, must uh, disappear. God will be right to say, this person is truly penitent. Other people ought to have forgiven, forgiven him because he was penitent, or at least, although they have no duty to do so, they can't expect God to forgive them. So if they want him to forgive them, uh, they've got to forgive Hitler. Um, and that seems right. Uh, if they don't want to forgive him, but that's fair enough, they have the right to do that. But then they must think that they they have they still owe God. Uh, they are still guilty in the face of God.
world for whatever they've done wrong. Well, let me uh, get bring this a little bit more back down to earth since we've talked in sort of more uh, philosophical tones. I want to talk about popular culture and society today in the early 21st century. And uh, uh, certainly here in the United States, and I would I would presume that, that it's the same over in the UK, we see television shows where we see the heroes of films and television are often characters we would describe as evil. Uh, just recently, I rewatched the Third Man film with uh, the character of Harry Lyme, played by Orson Welles. And he's a thoroughly evil person, and he's a charming person, uh, but he's clearly depicted as an evil character. If you watch television shows, and I can only name some from here, the U.S., like The Sopranos, where you have uh, you know, a mafia boss who's... Uh, portrayed as a hero. Other shows, they'll have serial killers portrayed as a hero. You listen to popular music, oftentimes you, you hear a lot of uh, vile uh, acts being encouraged by, by singers or, or rap stars. Do you think that, that uh, all of this portrayal of characters and actions and, 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 and deeds that we would, if they were in fiction, definitely call evil, uh, helps to course in society in your people to to some of the things that they are later going to experience? Do you believe that the, there's a correlation? Oh, yes, I do, very much so. But uh, it seems fairly obvious to me that that, uh, that would be the case. Um, if you get the impression from the television that certain sorts of behavior are normal, then you are more inclined to do it than if you get the impression that certain sorts of behavior are wicked. Um, yes. But uh, I stress I am a sociologist, and so one might need to put various qualifications on this because, after all, some fictions are so obviously fictions that you're not expected to take any serious message from them. But um, with certain qualifications, yes, I entirely accept what you say. Yeah, obviously, when you're talking about, you know, supernatural monster types, uh, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm talking more along the lines of the Tony Soprano from a show like The Sopranos or, or other grisly characters. Um, uh, let, me, let me ask uh, then uh, a little bit more about, uh, I guess, personal, uh, more on a personal level. Um, there's a term that's come about uh, in the last few years called first world problems. And I think it's probably come about mostly because of the stuff in the Middle East. And when we talk about, or we talk about the suffering in the Sudan or whatnot, and then we look at the little evils that we might call that we, that most people here in the West have to endure a bad boss, uh, a cheating girlfriend or this or that. Um, do you, do you see, uh, again, in a hierarchical sense that, uh, a lot of, of people, say, in the Western democracies, um, maybe make too much of their sufferings vis-a-vis -vis other people's sufferings. And do you think that that's a sort of hubris uh, that in and of itself is a minor sin? Uh, well, I certainly agree that uh, we, we all concentrate on uh, our own sufferings and the suffering of those we can see around us and don't pay so much attention to the sufferings of the, the, the much worse sufferings of those distant. That is the case and of course it's always been the case. Um, there's not a particular feature of uh, uh, us, our society. But um, uh, we notice it more because, after all, the, the sufferings of those far distant from us are very visible on the telly, whereas previously we only heard of them by uh, reports, uh, oral reports from people who took a long time to travel from there. So um, it is a bit worse these days simply because the sufferings of others are much more drawn to our attention. Um, yes, yes, uh, this is the case. Um, well, let me... As I say, I okay. think you'll find, ever since there have been humans, uh, they've been more interested in themselves than in others, and this is part of, part of the desires, 
produced by nature and nurture with which we start and which we have to learn to control. Okay. Well, we've talked about big ideas of evil, small ideas, current ideas. We've talked a bit about some historical uh, things regarding evil. So I want to sort of uh, bring this uh, conversation towards its end in this segment, and then we'll do a final segment where I'll, uh, we'll have some closing remarks. I want to just get, I guess, to the nub of what most people, when they speak uh, of evil from a Christian perspective, often have a problem with. And that's the idea of the all-powerful God, the all-loving God, the all-good God, yet also the God who created, uh, presumably, uh, Satan or Lucifer, uh, uh, the angel that what became an apostate, became evil, supposedly is the agent of evil in the world, uh, therefore nullifying the idea that if God is all-knowing, he would have known Satan would have turned on him and I, then either didn't have the power to stop him. And then doesn't that make God ultimately responsible for all the evil in the world, even the evil that men do. And isn't that isn't evil then a non-natural evil dependent upon agency and free will? And then, you know, again, free, is free will an illusion then? So uh, how, how do you reconcile those classical arguments? Uh, a number of points. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, Satan. Um, I don't think Satan is a very important figure in the Christian uh, viewpoint. You don't find him mentioned in uh, the Nicene Creed, for example, which is the central creed of Catholics and Orthodox. Um, uh, yes, there ha uh, you get occasional mentions of him in scripture, but um, pretty occasional. Uh, I, I don't think he's a big player, shall we say. Uh, so I don't think there's anything that I don't think Christians need to believe there is such a being. Um, but, uh, or if you do believe in him, you don't really have to think of him entirely as a rational agent, but a sort of irrational force of evil. Or you may think of him, I have no, I've been agnostic about this myself, um, as very much uh, a personal being who has rebelled against God. And that is, of course, the traditional view in, in later Christian thought. Um, uh, but the issue of the compatibility of omniscience, um, freedom and gods uh, and evil, uh, of course, exists, or the problems there exist, whether or not you believe that um, uh, there is a devil. Um, my own view about God's omniscience is that um, God, if God gives us free will, he doesn't know fully what we'll do. And the same applies to, to uh, if he creates Satan. This is a bit out of line with, with uh, most of Christian tradition, uh, but you'll certainly find that to some extent in scripture. Um, you may, for example, remember the story of Jonah the Old Testament. Yes. Uh, Jonah was told to preach to the people of Nineveh, um, who had been a very wicked city, and he was uh, told by God, according to the story, to say, in 60 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. But in fact, Nineveh repented, and God didn't destroy uh, Nineveh. And uh, Jonah was uh, annoyed about this, <laughs> saying, I, I preached, nothing happened. And God said, well, what a good thing it was that nothing happened. Uh, that is to say, uh, God expected uh, Nineveh not to, not to repent, but it did, so God didn't punish them. Um, and um, if I, it's what may seem a slight digression, but um, God is supposed not to be just omniscient, but to have various other qualities, including omnipotence. There's, now, omnipotence is naturally spelt out as power to do anything, but nobody supposed, no one in the Christian tradition is supposed that this means that God can make me exist and not exist at the same time, or God can yeah. change the past or anything like that. That is to say, omnipotence is only the power to do what is logically possible. But I think we should regard omniscience in a rather similar light. It's God can know everything that's logically possible to know. But if God gives us free will, then it's up to us at the time of our action what we do. And no causes 
and nothing from beforehand can determine what we do. So God leaves it to us, and God does not know how we will choose. Of course, God may have a much better idea, uh, even than we do in advance, what we will do. But nevertheless, he does not know infallibly what we will do. And so, God hopes we will do the right thing. And there's another story in, in uh, the um, Old Testament that brings that out. You remember the story of Noah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Noah, people become very wicked in Noah's day. And um, as well as that, uh, God told the good man Noah to uh, ha uh, build his ark and uh, then he would send the flood. Now, when God saw that the world was very wicked, the book of Genesis said, and God repented that he had made the world. Um, I always remember that's a, such a significant phrase that I can tell you the chapter and verse in chapter 6, verse 6. Um, and um, what that said, oh, that God, would, God was sorry that he made the world. It was a mistake because people have been so wicked. And uh, that, I think, is the attitude that, that God takes today. That is to say, he uh, makes us in hope. He gives us responsibility. He no doubt encourages us in various ways. But in the end, he doesn't determine what we will do. We do, and we may let him down. Well, it seems to me that the logical outflow from that is you're stating that mankind has the agency to conquer or submit to evil. If so, let me ask your own personal opinion, just looking ahead into the vast future. Do you believe that mankind at some point will subjugate his slash her evil tendencies? And if so, do you think that's necessarily a good thing? Because without evil, can we really be good? to the first is I believe in free will and therefore I do not make predictions about the future except to us. Well, it's a good thing. Oh, yes, because um, I have not been saying in what I've been saying to you, I have not been saying that the world is a, a better world than it would be without an evil. I've said it's not a worse evil, or oh, not a worse world. That is to say, um, if God had made a world in which we only do good, uh, that would be a very good world. But he would have deprived us of a certain sort of good, that is the good to choose whether to do good. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what he has given us. Uh, and so we have as it were, the best of both worlds, because we now have a world with a choice. But uh, since it would be rather good for us in other ways to have a world in which we naturally do good, we have the choice of turning this world into the next world. And that, of course, is the traditional picture of heaven. It's a world where people don't do evil. Yeah, in a world without evil, we'd sort of seemingly end up like H.G. Wells's uh, creatures, the the uh, Eloy, but without any Morlocks. We'd just sort of be uh, lazy creatures that just sort of wandered about. Uh, no. We, no. we only go to heaven if we have a great concept of the good and a great wish to do the good, and we know what the difference is because we've seen evil in this world. Okay, well, let's uh, end this segment. And in my final segment, uh, I'll let you wrap up your thoughts on evil and we'll end the interview and we'll do that in a moment. I am speaking with theologian and philosopher Richard Swinburne. We've been talking about the nature of evil. I want to just end this interview, giving him a few minutes to wrap up his thoughts. Richard, if you could just sort of uh, sum up your ideas both on a personal level and also from a larger Christian slash world perspective on the nature of evil. So anything you have to say? Well, I think I've got nothing to say that I haven't already said, but uh, in summary, uh, God provides us with a world in which uh, often natural evils occur, we have to suffer, and often, uh, but he also gives us free will, uh, free will as to how to deal with these natural evils, and free will as to whether uh, we yield to 
of bad desires or desires which on a particular occasion we ought, although normally good, we ought to keep in check. And so he provides us with choices. And by our choices, we can either make ourselves very good people and or very bad people. Our choices are not merely good in uh, that they have a, a good effect, but they're on whoever we are influencing, but they have a good effect on ourselves. And so he's made a world which is um, a half-made world, and it's up to us to make it uh, a good sort of world or a bad sort of world and to make ourselves a good sort of person or a bad sort of person. And this is a great gift. Uh, the great gift cannot be had without an alternative. Um, it's only if we have the choice, it's up to us whether we do good. It can only be really up to us if there's an alternative that we do evil instead. Um, and um, that is sometimes a heavy price to pay, but it's a price worth paying because it's so good that we shall be able to share in the creative activity of God. And it's not a, the, the world is not finished by God. It's up to us to finish and we can share in that. And that's a great good for us to have a control over how things go with the world and how things go with ourselves. And that's what I've been saying. Well, I want to thank you for this discussion. Um, this is the second of three discussions on the nature of evil. In about a month, I'll have a scientist talking about the scientific uh, viewpoint on evil. Tomorrow, I'll actually be discussing uh, with a scientist the nature of death itself. So uh, anyone who enjoyed this discussion with uh, Richard Swinburne should uh, watch that as well. If you want to find out more about Richard and his ideas, I will link below this video to his website, and you can contact him or look up his works and books. Again, uh, I want to thank you, Richard, for your time.